today I'm finishing up my sermon series, although some of you didn't hear the first few, but I can get them for you if you want. The sermon series on the seven churches of Revelation. And uh, each church has a message for us today in what we're going through and what we're experiencing and our, our good points and our bad points, you know, such as it is. Our sermon today is, and if, if I were to ask you the question, what church is the seventh church of Revelation? Can you just say it to me right away? The church of Laodicea. That's right. And my sermon title today is called Bathtub Believers. Now, you're going to wonder what on earth, what on earth does that mean? Bathtub Believers. Well, we'll find out. We'll find out. But let's uh, I invite you to join me now as we bow our heads for another word of prayer. Thank you. Father in heaven, we come to you now as we open your word, as we delve into the seventh church of Revelation, the church of Laodicea. Many already know what the message is to the church of Laodicea. But I pray, Father, that you will open our hearts and our minds Make this message be current in our lives. And Father, I ask again that you will speak through me. Remove this weak vessel that your words will come forth with power and glory and uplifting your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today our journey is complete in regards to the seven churches of Revelation. And we have arrived at our final stopping point along this journey about the church of Laodicea. So right from the get-go, let's open the Word of God. Revelation chapter 3. I invite you to turn there. Revelation chapter 3, and we'll begin at verse 14. And uh, this will uh, lay out for us what exactly God is saying to this church of Laodicea. Are you there? Amen. And here we go, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why does he do that? Why does he want to spew the Laodiceans out of his mouth? Well, verse 17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. And now God qualifies this, and he gives counsel in verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, now I like this part, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. But he doesn't stop there. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door, and does, what does he do? Knocks and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. You know, very powerful, very powerful. And I know that if we were to compare the seven churches of Revelation with the seven corresponding eras of the Christian church, we would find that the message to the Laodiceans is a message that pertains prophetically to our time period. We are in that time period, the church of Laodicea. And it should come as no surprise, then, that though there may be some who have not read the letter to Laodicea before, yet the words are still very familiar. When we read those, when I read those words, was it familiar to you? Did you hear them before? I'm sure you did. The rebuke of Jesus against lukewarmness is a common cry today. Shouted against the church from both pew and pulpit. People lament. 
You know, we need to get out of our lethargy, right? We need to get going in Jesus, right? And of course, who hasn't heard the famous appeal, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We've heard it in sermons. We've, we've heard it preachers preaching up front in the pulpit. We've heard it at seminars. We've heard it, you know, in prophetic meetings. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's an invitation, right? In fact, though, as I read the passage just now, I'm sure your mind already knew many of the words that I read and simply filled in the rest. It's a message that we have become familiar with. Perhaps too familiar. Right? Perhaps too familiar. And I say that because as I researched these seven churches and I got to this Laodicean church, and I said in my heart, I know what the Bible says about the Laodicean. I know that they're lukewarm. I know that God would rather that they were cold and that, or, or hot. So what have I got to learn on this? Well, God always has something for us to learn. Personally. We discover here that the spirit of the churches is calling, calling us to do more than just recite this passage, even from memory. To do more than just repeat the catchphrases that we have gleaned over the years. Do Adventists have catchphrases? Oh yes, we have our own catchphrases. We do. Not that they're bad, but we do have catchphrases. But you know, this morning, the Spirit of God is calling us to dig deeper, to hear his message today. So instead of tuning out, let us lay aside what we think this letter is saying. Let's lay aside all preconceived ideas. Wake up our spiritual sensitivities. Ask God to wake us up to our spiritual sensitivities and tune in to the Word of God to see what these texts are actually declaring for us today. Now, our Lord begins his letter with the words, I know your works. Now, isn't that interesting? Right from the get-go, I know your works. In any letter, it is often, if you receive a letter in the mail, like back, back in the old days, you know, when you used to get a letter, thank you for, thank you for your letter, uh, Myrtle, by the way. Okay, I'm going to say that publicly. What a blessing. But what I'm saying, in the old days, you used to receive a letter in the mail. Right? And when you anticipated in opening up that letter, it was something that you, you were thrilled to get a letter in the mail. Right? And you open it up, and it's usually the first line that sums up the rest of the letter. It's usually that first line that catches your attention. right? So it's often the first few words spoken in the letter. What's great importance. Now here we see that God's primary concern is what to this letter to Laodiceans? What is it? It's our works. It's our works. Of all the ways God could have begun his letter, of all ways, of all the things that he could have expressed over which he takes greatest issue with in the church, we discover that it is our works. Can you believe it? Now this when I asked God to reveal to me something that I didn't hear before, this was one of them. I know I read it before, but it hit home. What are we doing? What is the utmost importance to him? In fact, as you look over to the letter of the other churches, you will find that the five of the seven letters begin with the words, I know your works. Five of the seven churches, the letter begins, I know your works. Now, that's a sobering testimony, and it stands in stark contrast with the mindset of many modern Christians today. Now, here's a catchphrase, and it's not Adventist. Well, maybe it is. We are living in the age of grace. Have you ever heard that? We are living in the age of grace, which connotates that at one point we were not living in the age of grace. So if someone were to say, we are now living in the age of grace, it sort of insinuates that at one time in the Old Testament days, they were not living in the age of grace. Does that make sense? Is it true? Absolutely not. God's grace is sufficient for all in all times, Old Testament and New. But this common accepted theory is there's another one called, oh, here's another uh, catchphrase. Um, 
Once saved, always saved. Have you heard that one? That's a catchphrase. Is it true? No, it's not true, right? It's not biblically sound. Um, why is it not true? Why is it that we can't, once we're saved, we're, we're just not always saved? Why? It's because of choice. Because of free will. Because of choice. Does that mean if we make a choice and we sin that we're not in a saved condition that we'll always be lost? No. It means we repent. We choose that gift of repentance and we come back to God and we're in that saving grace again, right? It's very simple. So it says here that uh, it's a sobering testimony that these catchphrases are in stark contrast to actually what God says in his word. So in the age of grace, let's talk about that a little bit. In the age of grace, the theory is, they don't say it's a theory, they say it's reality. Our works are no longer important. Just confess that Jesus is Lord and you are saved. That's, what's, that's the common understanding. Just accept Jesus as your personal Savior. The works don't matter. So, what's wrong with that? They will tell you that to make profession of faith is enough. That to be baptized is sufficient. And that further works are unnecessary. Is that true? To the once saved, always saved subscribers, the good works do no more to merit the kingdom of heaven than the evil works do to keep you out. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you do evil. It doesn't matter if you do good. You're still saved. Right? That's the once saved, always saved understanding. I'm not, saying, I'm not speaking anything new here, am I? No. A young woman once told an evangelist that it doesn't matter that she smokes and drinks and lives with her boyfriend. She professes that Jesus is Lord, and so she's saved. Is that right? But you know, as I studied this message, these messages to all the churches, I discovered that the works of his professed followers are of great significance in God's eyes. So where's the correlation? Where's the balance here? Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. We are not saved by our works. It's clear we're not. We're not saved by our works. We are told that our works do not just make a difference, but to God, our works are the difference. Now, if I were to leave it there, there would be some people that might be offended because they might attribute that I'm saying that it's through our works that God saves us. And I'm not saying that. I'm not. Now let me clarify. Now, I can imagine, you know, that when we talk about works, there are many who say, okay, well, that's legalistic. That's a legalistic form. You know, uh, you're going to be labeled a legalistic, a, legalis a legalist, a legalist, uh, because you're advocating works. And that's not what I'm doing. Nowhere in Scripture are we told that we are to work for our salvation. The only work that was needed for our salvation was accomplished on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago by someone more capable than you and I. Now, follow me closely. Our works do not save us. You can never do enough. You can never earn your salvation or even attempt to do so, is to render the cross of Jesus Christ useless. So you were could get to heaven because of works Jesus never had to die. If you, had, if you could work your way to heaven, Jesus would not have to die. Right? So you don't work your way to heaven. So why does God place such an emphasis on works in five of the churches of Revelation? Why does he do that? The answer to that question is found in the next statement God makes to Laodicea. I know your works, he says, and it is your works that reveal the truth of your situation. Okay? Let me say that again. It is your works that reveal the truth of your situation. You are neither cold nor hot, is his declaration. He knows this because he knows what the church is up to. 
God knows what his church is up to in any age. And he knows what the remedy is. And as he watched the church of Laodicea operate, he comes to the conclusion that this church needs help. It needs help. Now, is he judging this church? I'm going to say a tentative no. He's not judging the church per se. He merely sees what's, what they're doing right now, and he's making a statement that will cause them to change. It is a remedy. So, how do we look at it? The Word of God tells us what is going on in our lives often reveals a lot of what's going on in the, the heart. Right? The works that the Laodicean Christians were involved in revealed a great deal about the state of their hearts. What kind of state were their hearts? In fact, as God took stock of Laodicea, what he witnessed caused his stomach to what? Sour. It caused him an upset, upset stomach. You see, Laodicea had become what we call a lukewarm church. A few weeks ago, I talked about the church of the frozen chosen. You know, a little tongue-in-cheek. Church of the frozen chosen, the church of the church of Sardis. And today we meet the church of the bathtub believers. Now, what on earth does that mean? Bathtub believers. Well, Let's put it this way. In a bathtub, most of us do not want steaming, scalding hot water, do we? And we don't want freezing cold water. We want nice, comfortable water that we can get into and relax, right? So like someone taking a lazy soak in a warm tub, Laodicea had become apathetic and lethargic. The church was content with the title of Christian, was good at making profession of faith, but had failed desperately in doing anything with what they actually professed. It's very strong, this message. This, we are told, is unacceptable to God in any form. The message of Laodicea tells us today that a profession of faith in Jesus Christ without an accompanying lifestyle is not only intolerable to him, it's actually repulsive. It's repulsive. We know it's repulsive because he says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Or some loose translations say, I will regurgitate you out of my, my mouth. You can't tolerate it. And purging the stomach of that which does not agree. So we are told God will purge from his body of believers all whose lives are not lived in accordance with their profession. Now, does that sound harsh? It can, if you understand it, in the wrong context. Let me put it this way. With God, being a bathtub believer is not an option. It's not an option. In fact, God states in no uncertain terms that he would rather have us absolutely hot or absolutely cold. Right? I can agree with that because... I remember one time when I was absolutely cold, miserable, living in the world, destitute of God. But yet when God brought me to that place where I could look up and finally say, I can't do this without you, Jesus. That's cold coming into his presence, right? He can work with the cold. After all, he can raise the dead, can he? He can raise the dead to life. And spiritually dead people too. That's a good thing. Anyway, when it comes to God, the middle road is not tolerable. That's like sitting on the fence. Right? God doesn't like that either. He doesn't want you to sit on the fence. He wants you to make a choice. It's a known fact that some of the most stalwart Christians, you know, those who are strong and steady and firm in the history, are those who once fought against the gospel most violently. Now, when I say that, what comes to mind? Who fought against the gospel violently in the New Testament? Saul. Right? The scripture tells us Saul of Tarsus, a man who wanted to single-handedly wipe Christianity off the map. But somewhere along the way, 
he came face to face with his Jesus. And once he encountered the amazing grace of God, that same man who fought against the Christian message with every ounce of strength that he had, he now proclaimed it with every ounce of strength that he had a total 180 degree reversal. And only Jesus Christ can do that. So if you find yourself in the middle ground, there's still hope for you, right? Right? He wants all. He'll, he'll, he'll take none with him, though, who are lukewarm. Now here is the Jesus that Paul serves. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 8, and I'll read it again. That's our scripture reference this morning. And I, and I encourage you to take home and read that again, prayerfully study it, and see what God reveals to you about it. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5. Let this mind be in you. What mind? Which was also in Christ Jesus, so the mind of Christ. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a what? A servant. And was made in the likeness of men. He condescended to come down to this earth. And being found in fashion as a man, he what? There's a key word here. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. What do you say? What do you say to that? What do you actually say to that? That text caused me to pause and reflect on my own life. Where was I or where am I with Jesus? Do I have the mind of Christ? This Bible text is telling me that everyone can have the mind of Christ. Right? It's telling us every single person here or every single person watching can have the mind of Christ. Now I know I want to serve a Savior like this. This is the kind of Savior I want to serve. There's a powerful reason why Jesus talks so much about works, and it has to do with his ultimate humility. There's a connection. You see, the works are an outward demonstration of the condition of the heart. A humble heart will show forth works. It's almost like a paradox, isn't it? But it's true. And it is also a reflection of their state of mind. Going on in the letter to Laodicea, God explains in verse 17 exactly what their mindset is. Now, we just heard about Jesus' mindset. We just heard about that we can all have the mindset of Jesus. Now, what's the mindset of Laodicea? Revelation 3.17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, you don't know that you're miserable, you don't know that you're poor and blind and naked. You don't know your condition. Don't miss the significance of what was just said here. A moment ago, we learned that our works are the outward expression of what's going on in the heart. Laodicea had a problem with a lukewarm attitude toward a Christian lifestyle even. And here in verse 17, 17, we're told why. A literal translation from the Greek would read something like this. You say, I am rich, I have everything, and you can't add anything to what I have. You just, I've got it all. I've got it all. I've got all the faith. You know, I expound upon holy things. And now we hear the words, I, ri I am rich. We often think in terms of material wealth, don't we? We talk about richness, material wealth, you know, money and other possessions. However, the wealth being spoken of here is a far different nature than mere silver or gold. To understand what kind of wealth we're talking about here, we need to go over to the book of Colossians. So if you want to turn there, you can, or you can write it down. Colossians chapter 2, the second chapter of Colossians, and we're going to start with verse 1. So Colossians chapter 2, and starting with verse 1, the Bible says this. Verse 1, for I would that ye knew, 
what great conflict I have for you. Wow. Now he's telling us we're going to have a great conflict. And for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now there's a lot in those verses. But suffice it to say, let me read verse 1 again but in the New American Standard Bible version. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have in your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea. God is struggling with these people. And apparently the Colossian church was struggling too. They had a lot in common with the church of Laodicea, this Colossian church. In fact, we are told in Colossians that the two churches exchanged the letters of Paul that had Paul had written to them. And it would be safe then to conclude that what we read in Colossians also applied to Laodicea. You know why? Because Paul said so in those texts. So what's the wealth we're talking about here? As we read in Colossians chapter 2, is that the wealth that they were given was not found in silver or gold but in the full assurance of understanding. In the full assurance of understanding. I'll say it again. In the full assurance of understanding. Where do we get the full assurance of understanding? In the Word of God. Right? In the Word of God. In other words, they were blessed with great spiritual understanding and wisdom and insight. Now, with this in mind, let's go back and reread Revelation 3.17 and see what the passage is trying to say. Okay? Revelation 3.17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, poor, blind and naked. If we understand the wealth being spoken of here to mean spiritual wisdom and knowledge, then what Laodicea is saying is that they think they've got it all. They think they know it all. And you know something, folks? I can stand up here and I can say there's nothing worse than a know-it-all Christian. <laughs> Isn't that true? You know, I, I'm being blunt, but it's true. There, you know why there's nothing worse than the know-it-all Christian? Because they have an unteachable spirit. Right? They can't learn at the feet of Jesus because they know it all already. Right? You know... <laughs> What can you say? What can you say? May none of us be know-it-all Christians. In the realm of spiritual truth and sound doctrine, as it were, these know-it-all Christians have cornered their markets, so to speak. More than an attitude of material satisfaction, the church of Laodicea has fallen into a state of spiritual arrogance. Now, if there is such a thing as a know-it-all Christian, then there's nothing worse than that because that's spiritual arrogance. That there is spiritual arrogance. They've been blessed with great insights into the word of God. They hold the true doctrines. They obey all of God's commandments. They consider themselves better and more acceptable to God than those around them and more spiritual than those in other churches who may not have these same understandings. I know I have the truth. You know, almost like this, you know. <clears throat> I have the truth and I have arrived. There's nothing worse than that type of Christian. And let's face it, folks. There are those type of Christians in the Adventist church too. Right? There is. And the way they look at it, they've reached a state of complete understanding. They know all about it now. They've become spiritual know-it-alls, as it were, and because of this we are told they have been blinded to how ignorant of the things of God they actually are. The deep things of God. You know what I'm talking about. The deep things of God. Notice how God speaks to them, these people. You may think you have it all figured out, God says. You may think you understand it all, but in reality you don't know a quarter of it or a third of it or a fraction, point zero 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 nine of us. 
You know nothing of the deep things of God. In fact, he says, what we do know is worthless. Our understanding is absolutely pointless. Our great spiritual insights are a waste of time. We are shameful. We do not know it. We are naked but refuse to see it. We are wretched but refuse to admit it. We deceive ourselves into thinking we have everything when in reality we have nothing at all. Now this sounds drastic, doesn't it? Is it drastic? It is drastic. And it's supposed to be drastic. Because God wants anyone who's in this condition to open their eyes. Have you ever asked God for the gift of discernment? Be careful when you ask that. Be careful. Because if God sees fit to give you that gift, he will open to you things that you could not have possibly imagined. And even the deep things of God. So if you want to ask for that, get the discernment. Ask it, but be prepared. Because he will. What can I say? How does a church get to such a place as this? How do Christians who have such knowledge of the scriptures not see their true condition? And the answer is found in Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I stand, listen to these words very carefully because they're important and sometimes we don't see, and I didn't see this either, but we don't see it in the right context. Let's understand what God is saying here in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me, or he or she with me. Okay. Now, when I heard that text before, I've heard it out of context. You've heard it many times. You know, just in a sermon or something, and all of a sudden the scripture is thrown out there. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's used as, a, as an invitation to let Christ open the door to your heart, right? And that's the right thing. That is right. But there's something we're missing here. Something we may be missing. What context is this verse in? This verse is in context to the church of Laodicea. From Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. This is all a message to the church of Laodicea, correct? Am I right? Yeah. So, if Christ is saying this, behold, I stand at the door. Who's he standing at the door to? The church. The church. Behold, I stand at the door of the church and knock. Is someone going to answer? Why is Christ outside the door of the church knocking to get in? You ever look at it that way before? I know I didn't. I looked at it as a something, you know, knocking at your heart. And he is. But there's another context here. This is spoken to the church of Laodicea. They, they had basically become uh, lethargic enough that Christ wasn't even in the picture anymore. They had basically cast him out of their church he was knocking to get back in. Did you ever hear that way before? I, I don't got a feeling you might not have. But it's very sobering. It's extremely sobering. And it's something I had to take back. Wow. This, this I did not see before. So, Jesus is standing there patiently. He's knocking at the door, waiting to see it open so that he may enter in. It's a beautiful picture. It's a moving appeal, like I said. But the first thing that we miss about this appeal, who is Jesus talking about here? It's the church. This appeal is directed at the people of God. Not to unbelievers specifically, but to professed followers of Jesus. Now, would you think a professed follower of Jesus would need to have Jesus come into their heart? Absolutely, yes. We need Jesus in our heart every single second of the day, right? This is an appeal that Jesus is making to you and to me. 
Understand, Jesus speaking to his church. And the second thing we miss about this, and I believe it's the most important, is where is Jesus standing when he makes his appeal? And I already made reference to it. He's standing outside the doors of the church. Somehow Jesus standing outside his church. That is unbelievable. But God is saying so right here in this verse. Because of the Laodicean state. Right? He's waiting for his people to open that door. He's not going to force himself in, is he? Brothers and sisters, the problem with the church in Laodicea is that they become so absorbed in having the knowledge of Jesus that they end up pushing Jesus himself right out the door. The church was so obsessed with the knowledge of salvation they had that having that knowledge took the place of having the Savior in their lives. They became so arrogant about the fact that they were keeping God's law that the law took the place of the great lawgiver. The lawgiver. Self has taken the throne of the heart in their lives. It's no longer about knowing Jesus personally as their Savior, but knowing a lot about him. That's two different things. Two totally different things. And comparing how much they know against what others know. Have you ever witnessed that? I've seen it over the years in, um, you know, Sabbath school study. Right? You get some strong-minded people and they're bantering back and forth and they, they might differ and they can almost come to blows. It gets that bad, you know, sometimes. I'm not saying in this church. I, I have witnessed it, though. I think some of you probably have here, too. I don't know. <laughs> but we lose sight of why we're here. It's not about the knowledge, although knowledge is important. It's not about that. You know, it's terrible when we come to a place of self-righteousness because when we claim to know so much, a little realizing that the righteous one may no longer be in their lives. And the more we push him away, the less clearly we are able to see our true condition. It's almost like we talked about last couple of weeks ago, maybe. The unpardonable sin. We don't talk about the unpardonable sin anymore because, you know, that's going to offend people. Right? You can't, you can't talk about the unpardonable sin anymore, anymore because that's going to offend people. It's not about offending people. It's about to share forth the love of God so that they can see their real condition and come to Jesus. That's the only purpose for any of this. And yet, through all this, I can say, and you can say, praise God. Through it all, through the midst of this Laodicean state, whether it's all the seven churches and what they found themselves or willingly went down those dark roads, you know, paganism and the whole nine yards, but yet God is still there. No matter what, he put these counsels in the word of God that we might not fall into their same traps. Difficult that this letter is to read it is still filled with hope and is still filled with promise. There are many who have said that Jesus despised this church. Now, is that true? Now, we understand the Bible says that God will spew them out of his mouth, right? Because of their Laodicean state. But does that mean that God despises them? We read in Revelation 3.19 that despite our ignorance, despite our arrogance, despite the stern rebuke and severe warning to profess followers, it is the banner of his love that overshadows all. This message of rebuke is God's love. And we live in society that doesn't see it that way anymore. You can't say these things because you're going to offend them. You have offended my sensibilities. You have offended me personally. The word of God is a double-edged sword, is it not? Let us never lose sight of that fact. Precious souls will be brought to the saving knowledge of Jesus because of this double-edged sword spoken in love. Right? And let's remember what Ellen White said one time about this whole thing. 
and I know you know it well. And she says this, I testify to my brethren and sisters that the church of Christ, here's the word everyone's going to know, enfeebled and defective as it may be, is the only object on which he, that's Christ, bestows his, that's Christ, his supreme regard. Even if he's standing outside the door and knocking to get to let him back in, he still, he still looks at the church with supreme regard. The church is the apple of his eye. That same love that drove him to Calvary over 2,000 years ago is pleading with each and every one of us today here in this room and each and every one watching and listening online. The same mouth that speaks in rebuke is there to speak words of comfort and hope, right? Let it never be said that Christ has abandoned his church because he will never abandon his church. It's us that may abandon him. There are many in closing, there are many in Christ's church who through their own vain ambitions have kicked the Savior out. You know, and that's sad. The Savior re reveals in his precious word the ones who have a form of godliness, a knowledge of the truth, but do not have the sure and certain presence of the indwelling Savior in their heart. The Savior may be on the outside this morning. I'm not saying he is. But if he is on the outside this morning, he has not left the scene. It is at, he is at the heart's doorway just now. As we speak, Jesus stands and to us who claim to know him so well, he makes the appeal. Is Jesus is the great appealer, I call it, uh, the great appealer. He appeals to us to come, sup with him, be with him, learn at his feet. You can't be blessed, perhaps, like the disciples were, and physically you know, walk with him side by side that way. But we have even greater blessing. A greater blessing. We have their experiences recorded in the precious words of life. He is the supreme commander of our hearts. We know the scriptures, but do we know the one whom the scriptures declare is the way and the truth and the life? Does he stand at your side as your savior, as your friend, as your king, as your master? That word is not used a lot today because it connotates a servanthood to serve a master. Do you know something? I would rather serve this kind of master than the masters we find out there in the world. Amen? Does he stand here today? Yes, he does. Have you pushed him outside? I can't answer that for you. I can answer it for myself. And I can say, yes, there are times when I have pushed him outside. But if we honestly reflect on a relationship with this Savior we're talking about here, we see that there are times, there may be times that we have pushed him outside. You know, I'm going to go be bold and say, you know something? I don't believe there's anyone in this particular church or any Adventist church that advocates, you know, the word of God and the truth. There is someone somewhere that has pushed Jesus out the door. There is. You want to just look at the law of averages, you know, but it's true. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the good news, so is this message good news? I hope it is. But there's good news here, and you know what it is? It's not too late. That's the good news. It's not too late. There's still time to let Jesus back in. And you, you may have a wonderful experience with Jesus. I'm not saying that. But can you have an even more wonderful experience in Jesus? You certainly can. The deep things of God, remember that. 
the deep things of God. That would be a good sermon, the deep things of God. There's still time to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And I will say this again. I said it one time before, many times before. These are the final words. There is still time to serve a risen Savior. And we can serve him while we work for him. There's a correlation. Our works do mean something. They don't save us. But it's like a litmus test. You know a litmus test in science? You stick the paper in, it turns a certain color, the chemicals or whatever, and tells you what, what chemical it is. Or a fish tank, pH level. All right? So the pH level in the fish tank is too high, fish die. pH level is too low, the fish die. So you take this litmus paper designed for fish tanks, you stick it in for 15 seconds, take it out, and if it's a certain color, uh, you know, the pH level is good, perfect. If it's too hard, too low, you got to do something about it. Works as a litmus test. That's all it is. But it's not too late. So I encourage each one here as we close. This message to the Church of Laodicea is a it's a, a hard message. And it's a difficult message. But it's not only one of rebuke. Rebuke is good. If the Lord, if the Lord is rebuking you, that's good. That's a good thing. If he's not rebuking you, then there's something maybe wrong. Right? So let us pray. And let us ask God, as we close, to invite him into our hearts. Okay? Let's do that. And I encourage you to stand as we pray. If you can. If you can't, that's fine. But if you can stand, please do so. To make that commitment to Jesus anew every single minute of the day to stand and to testify that Jesus, invite him in. If he's outside, to let him in. Shall we do that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this time that we can spend in your word. The book of Revelation is oftentimes, people understand it as a book of mystery or even a closed book. But we know that the book of Revelation is a revealing of the true Jesus that we serve. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you have given us these messages to the churches to not only rebuke us, to see where we may be falling short, but to encourage us that there is a way out. We thank you, Father, for giving us these words of hope and life and redemption. Father, if there's anyone watching, if there's anyone here who struggles with their relationship with this Jesus that Revelation talks about, we ask for the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to come upon their lives, that they may see the deep things of God and surrender their self to Him who is the risen Savior. Thank you, Father, for this time together and for this saving knowledge of Jesus, this saving grace, this saving forgiveness. It's not too late. The church, you love your church, Lord. You gave your life for your church. And even though you gave your life for your church, you find yourself outside knocking at the doors of the church. Oh, Father, help us. Help us to see our ways. Help us to see that there are times when we have cast you aside. Oh, Father, continue to knock at the door of our hearts. And as you come in, we'll be flooded with the peace that surpasses all understanding. Because we have been in the presence of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your great love and your awesome forgiveness. In Jesus' precious name, amen.